So in this segment, we're going to be discussing the situation around Gary Lineker. I'm a bit late to this, um, but I think it's worth discussing kind of the right wing capture of the BBC and discussing how it doesn't it doesn't really understand or seem to understand impartiality. So we start with a Gary Lineker tweet on March the 7th, where he says, good heavens, this is beyond awful, talking about a Suella Braverman clip where she talks about uh, invasions and all this other nonsense. And so Gary Lineker, the tweet that caused all of this mess, he says, uh, quote, there is no huge influx. We take far fewer refugees than other major European countries. This is just an immeasurably cruel policy directed at the most vulnerable people in language. That is not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 1930s, and I'm out of order, end quote. So effectively what he's saying is they're using very similar language to um, a certain party in the 1930s, which we know what they went on to do, but that's not what Gary Lineker is insinuating here. He's saying the language they are using is similar that of invasion and that kind of rhetoric, this is a problem, etc. So what Gary Lineker said is absolutely factual. There was nothing wrong with what Gary Lineker said. And if it's the case, surely you should be asking, why is Gary Lineker saying you echo 1930s Nazi Germany? Maybe that's the question you should be asking rather than attacking the person um, because he's right. And so what they did was they tried to weaponize Gary Lineker against the BBC. And so what happened was Gary Lineker was told to step back from presenting Match of the Day. Um, so originally it was told as Gary Lineker was stepping back. But no, we found out it was the BBC that actually pressured him into stepping back, which shows you that all of their priorities were wrong. You know, the Lineker row essentially became such a thing where it was covered back to back news coverage with them, you know, falsely, you know, some newspapers falsely claiming what Gary said, uh, which wasn't the case. And the Lineker row threatens to topple the BBC chiefs and hit Tory asylum plans. And let's not forget here that, you know, uh, Alan Shearer uh, wasn't going to cover Match of the Day. It was uh, Ian Wright. He said he wasn't going to cover it. You had, I think her name is Alex Scott, who didn't do... Um, the Football Focus show, along with, I think his name is Jason Mohammed, And what had happened was, basically, the BBC couldn't cover sports properly on that weekend, last Saturday and Sunday. And it became such a thing where loads of um, sports personalities were siding with uh, Gary Lineker. And then you also had the threat the BBC would have faced on Wednesday, which was yesterday, up to a thousand journalists were expected to walk out on the same day as the Jeremy Hunt um, budget delivery over this, over this row. That's what would have happened here. Um, the BBC were basically put themselves in a situation where journalists, you know, up to a thousand would have walked out um, in rebellion over what the uh, BBC chair um, has done here. And that was one of the reasons why I think the BBC caved and they said they apologised to Gary, uh, Gary Lineker. And um, we go on to see, you know, he's not had to offer an apology, at least as far as I'm aware of. And I think the BBC apologised to him over this whole fiasco. Um, and you know the Gary, the Lineker situation, the impartiality row leads to fresh calls for BBC chairman to uh, resign. A, pre a pressure growing on Richard Sharp to resign, and the Gary Lineker impartiality row. You know that's what's happening. The BBC, instead of instead of managing to damage Gary Lineker and anyone else here, they put the scope on themselves over impartiality. Um, this from Nadia Whitom, who said, "Quote: If we're going to talk about impartiality, let's talk about the fact that BBC chairman donated four hundred thousand pounds to the Conservative Party." End quote. And you know we should also talk about how he's good friends with Boris Johnson, who got him the gig at the role. We should also talk about how he helped um, help Boris Johnson get, I think it was, an £800,000 credit facility. That doesn't seem very impartial to me. Seems like he's very much good friends with Johnson. Um, and is such a person, can they hold back their biases? Apparently not. We had this tweet from Alan Sugar, who um, said, many, he said, quote, many a word spoken in jest, Corbyn. And the, uh, end quote, and the caption goes, when you're pictured at Nuremberg and claim you thought you're going to a car rally. And it's a picture of Jeremy Corbyn sat with Adolf Hitler. Yeah, you know, Alan Sugar wasn't called, uh, he wasn't, you know, called out for bias, despite the fact that he's a big personality. Yes, he doesn't work for the politics end of the BBC, but neither does Gary Lineker. So either your Twitter, you're allowed to say what you want on it, or you're not. That's what the BBC have to figure out here. Um, you got this from uh, Phil, who retweeted someone about the BBC complaints, uh, where they said, thank you for contacting us about this comment posted on Twitter by Chris Packman. Chris is a freelance TV presenter and a very well-established naturalist who works for other broadcasters, including Channel 5, uh, National Geographic and Sky Arts. His personal Twitter account has no connection to the BBC. So what you can see is that the BBC clearly drew a line between this person's tweets 
and their work for the BBC. And Gary Lineker has not spouted anything political on uh, Match of the Day, apart from, with the BBC's consent, he criticised Qatar. So it's okay to criticise Qatar, but you can't criticise the British government. Qatar, who we've rightfully called an authoritarian state, but when you criticise your own government, nah, you're done. You're done. Get out. You can't work for us anymore. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe the BBC really needs to think about things. And apparently, according to Gary Lineker's agent, he thought the BBC had agreed he could tweet about refugees, says his agent. Gary Lineker thought he had a special agreement with the BBC's Director General to tweet publicly on matters surrounding refugees and immigration, his agent said. So clearly... Either this was the case, and his agent is correct here, or it's the case that his agent's wrong. But I think what happened was he probably has some sort of agreement around tweeting, and what happened was the BBC got so much stick from the Conservative government, I think around 40-plus MPs called for Gary, uh, Gary Lineker to be sacked from the BBC. 40 snowflakes. 40 people who believe in cancel culture. Absolute shamelessness. My, uh, I, you know, I can't believe it. Um, genuinely 40 massive snowflakes and if he said right wing things do you think they'd be after him definitely not definitely not uh, we've got this from Andrew Marr which I found quite interesting about the current situation in the BBC flinching what can the BBC do now it's in a completely impossible position really now that he's become such a useful weapon against the BBC the BBC should part company with this sports presenter so obviously talking about Gary Lineker here but it can't just sack him for bias, because next everyone will turn to the small issue again of its own chairman being so closely connected to the Tory party in general and Boris Johnson in particular. I did mention at the time that I thought the Richard Sharp business was a problem. Because of his donations to the Conservative Party, everyone knew the guy was biased. The problem is... He went through a process, a selection process, in which Sunak says, oh, it was all above board here, but we didn't have the information about the credit facility. That sounds very important, don't you think? I think we didn't have any more information around him having dinners and things with Boris Johnson as well. Hmm. But the BBC can't effectively discipline Lineker either because he refuses to be effectively disciplined. I'm afraid, and I say this as a grateful former BBC employee who admires the corporation but left to get his own voice back, that the BBC is well and truly stuffed over this one. And when they say there's nothing you can say, say nothing the best thing it can do now is to stop reporting its own misery with such bizarre enthusiasm now let's you know let's not forget it was headline news on bbc for days i think for about a week and you know you've got andrew Marr saying they can't sack gary lineker because it would draw attention onto the uh, onto the chairman who donated money to the conservative party and you know you have the bbc chairman who was captured you had uh, robbie gibb who works um in the editorial section and this is just what he did to Lewis Goodall. You can see why Emily Matlis and Lewis Goodall left. John Sopel, I don't know much about, you know, in terms of his interaction with Robbie Gibb, but we've heard Emily Matlis mention this this Gibb guy before, and now we have um, and now we have Lewis Goodall talking about him. The BBC, Robbie Gibb, you know, made my life really difficult. Day after Robbie day. Gibb is the former director of communications for Theresa May, yeah. who then went to be on the board of, of the, the BBC. BBC, former communications, and also helped found. A rival broadcaster, yeah. GB News. Yeah. This man should never have been hired by the BBC. The fact that he's been appointed, he's clearly biased. I think he worked for the Daily Mail, doing puff pieces for Theresa May, went on to work for Theresa May, went on to help found GB News, and then you find out the BBC hires him. Why? Why, why would they hire such a person? Exactly. And, you know, not really talked about this before, he made my life really, really hard at the BBC. You know, day after day, I would hear from people saying, uh, you know, just watch it. Rob is watching you. Now, you know... Is this is this Brother Sauron? Like, what is going on here? Because they had created this sort of confection that somehow I was sort of Labour supporting or, you know, doing Labour stuff. You know, my gra by comparison to R Robbie Gibb, my sort of grand summit within the Labour Party was, you know, vice chair of Birmingham Northfield CLP and youth officer when I was 17 years old. And I'm sitting there going, hang on a minute, I'm being lectured about impartiality from a man who until checks notes, like, 12 months ago, was literally head of comms in Downing Street. It's ridiculous, honestly, absolutely ridiculous that this man got away with this stuff, uh, Robbie Gibbon. You can see why he would leave. And then we go on to the BBC's actual political wing, talking about Laura Koonsberg. You know, her report on Jeremy Corbyn was inaccurate. And this is where it gets really bizarre. 
So the BBC broke accuracy and impartiality rules in a News at Six report about Jeremy Corbyn's view on Shoot to Kill, the BBC's governing body has said. The item by BBC political editor Laura Koonsberg was shown three days after the Paris attacks in November 2015. A viewer complained that the report misrepresented the Labour leader's position on the use of lethal force in the event of such an attack in the UK. BBC News director James Harding said he disagreed with the BBC's trust ruling. And surely you'd think this James Harding guy should be sacked over this really. Um, considering he's gone against the trust there on something that's so uh, easy to disprove his kind of thoughts on it. In the report, Koonsberg said she had asked Corbyn, quote, if he were the resident at number 10, whether or not he would be happy for British officers to pull the trigger in the event of a Paris-style shooting, a uh, Paris-style attack, end quote. And Corbyn's reply, uh, supposed reply was, quote, I am not happy with the shoot to kill policy in general. I think that is quite dangerous. I think that can often be counterproductive, end quote. So essentially it's painting the picture of if there was a threat to a potential uh, Prime Minister Corbyn, would he, uh, would he be in favour of um, the police basically shooting down the, uh, the suspected terrorist? And Jeremy Corbyn seems to be saying, oh no, you know, obviously I wouldn't want to do that. that's counterproductive. Obviously not, you know. The question Koonsberg had asked during the interview, the actual question was, quote, if you were Prime Minister, would you be happy to order people, police or military, to shoot to kill on Britain's streets, end quote, which is very difficult, which is a very different question, which is, would you be happy to ask the police to do a shoot to kill? You know, essentially give them permission um, to use live ammunition. Um, the previous question in the interview in a section was not used on the news at six. He had been asked specifically about his response to a Paris style attack if he was prime minister and whether he would, quote, order security services onto the street to stop people being killed, end quote. Um, in answer to that question, Mr. Corbyn replied, of course, you'd bring people onto the streets to prevent and ensure there is safety within our society, end quote. So obviously he's there, you know, saying he, he would obviously allow police to have to step in and do what they have to do. The BBC Trust said the BBC, uh, quote, was wrong in this case to present an answer um, Mr. Corbyn had given to a question about shoot to kill as though it was his answer to a question he had in fact not been asked, end quote. And so what you can see is Laura Koonsberg deceptively changed the editing or someone deceptively edited this um, segment to make it look like he gave an answer he didn't give. And the BBC said, uh, quote, the breach was... Breach of due accuracy on such a highly contentious political issue meant the output had not achieved due impartiality. End quote. And you had that guy Harding talking nonsense, saying, quote, Laura is an outstanding journalist and political editor with the utmost integrity and professionalism. BBC News reported on the leader of the opposition in the same way it would any other politician. It is striking that the trust um, itself said there was no evidence of bias. Indeed, it also said the news report was compiled in good faith. End quote. And I do not think that is the case at all, that it was compiled in good faith. But again, proving bias, proving bad faith is quite difficult to do. Um, and so you can say it was just a mistake um, and mistakes happened, but I think it was done maliciously. But that's just my opinion. Was she punished over it? No, she was given a Sunday show instead. Um, you know, that's how the BBC have kept her on. Ridiculous. You know, we found out Gary Lineker is set to uh, return as Match of the Day host. Um, Tim Davey denies the climb down when obviously he did have to climb down from it. You can see, as we discussed in the story, former BBC employees saying um, there is a there's a right wing bias uh, essentially in the BBC. You had a thousand journalists set to walk out on the budget day from the BBC over this. That's how serious the situation was. Um, and we go on to our final uh, story, which further shows you the BBC how the BBC was captured by the government and the right wing. So breaking leaked messages reveal number 10 pressured BBC editors to go harder on Labour during COVID saying, quote, Downing Street complaining we're not reflecting Labour's mess of Plan B online, i.e. Ashworth said it earlier this week, then reversed. Can we turn up the scepticism on on this? A skepticism a bit on this end quote so instead of the instead of the bbc focusing on the government at the time and rightly so they should have done because the government's actions were horrendous they were told oh we need to focus on labor more absolutely ridiculous you know they were told can we avoid the word lockdown as well ridiculous ridiculous stuff here and we go on um, this from Sam Bright citing The Guardian. One BBC insider said, quote, particularly on the website, our headlines have been determined by calls from Downing Street on a very regular basis. End quote. They said the messages would have been a small snapshot on what was going on because most pressure was applied verbally rather than written down. Because when you write things down, you leave a paper trail. So what can we what can we gather from this video? And you can read The Guardian article here. 
Um, there's one more thing I actually want to talk about, which is the BBC will not broadcast David, ba- David Attenborough's episode over fear of right-wing backlash. David Attenborough that talks about animals and climate change. Why would the right wing be so concerned about you know things that are factual? And this, I think, this is further evidence that shows you that the BBC is governed by a fear of right wing backlash. The BBC has decided not to broadcast an episode of David Attenborough's flagship new series on British wildlife because of fears it, its themes of the destruction of nature would risk a backlash. I cannot tell you how embarrassing, embarrassing these, these kind of string of stories are, because this came out around the time of the Gary Lineker stuff as well. You know, the BBC cannot hide it's impartial hide behind impartiality it's bias let's let's be honest now the bbc is biased um you know to the point where they are scared of the right wing you can see here they are scared of tory politicians and the right wing press so if anyone tells you the bbc is left wing yeah they're dumb don't listen to them absolutely do not listen to them from what we gather from this video and all the evidence i've provided for you over these two cases here and of course the bbc employees as well the bbc has a right wing bias let's be honest now it's the bbc chairperson i think is he he's the one that's donated to the conservative party robbie gibb works there um by the looks of it in the editorial wing pressuring uh journalists over what they said you know robbie's got his eye on you what are you going to do sauron wannabe um absolutely ridiculous this lot and for anyone to deny it is is, is uh, shameful but what we can gather from this is the bbc have really shot themselves in the foot here um because at the end of the day they had to climb down because gary lineker is very much i think loved within the company um and he's not that unpopular in the country despite right wingers not liking him the dude's an england, england icon and he'll achieve it way more than any of these politicians will way more you know he's out here ratioing politicians just for the fun of it because he can um but yeah, what I hope you can learn from this video is the BBC has a big uh, a right wing bias. I think you can argue a centre right to right wing, in my opinion. But they do fear the press. They fear the press. They fear the Tory MPs more than anything, um, and they will not do the right things because of it. And that's tragic. It really is tragic. They will not. You know, Sir David Attenborough. He's a national treasure, just as I think Gary Lineker is. And the BBC will not. Uh, you know, not helping two of their assets really here. Gary Lineker, infinitely more popular than anyone else at the BBC, I'd argue. Um, but yeah, there's a massive right wing capture of the BBC. The B, you know, the government were writing headlines for them during COVID. The B, the government directly having editorial guidelines over the national broadcaster. You know, where else? What other countries? You know, if this happens in any any kind of Arab country, you'd say this is authoritarianism. If Qatar did this to Al Jazeera, you'd call it out authoritarianism. You'd say then the press isn't free. Um, but this is the UK, you know, you can criticise uh, Qatar, you can criticise authoritarian countries, um, you can talk openly about um, the war in Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, etc. But you talk about the British government, you're done. You're done. You do not talk about us. Um, remind me again how the BBCs are free, um, are free and impartial, really. Because uh, based on this, based on all of this, we can see the Tories have captured the BBC and they have done for a while now. I would argue since probably 2010. Um, the BBC has a massive uh, conservative bias. And this is what happens when you get involved in the culture war. No one wins here. Not really, anyways. But um, I'm going to leave it there. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Support the channel on Patreon if you can. And hopefully I'll see you in the next one.